Please join me in a spirit of prayer and meditation. After our spoken prayer and a time of silence, we will sing together hymn number 123, Spirit of Life, which is also in your order of service. Spirit of Life, be with me in my solitude. Allow time and space apart to center me, calm me, nurture and sustain me. Help me to use my time alone to understand myself more fully, to get in touch with my deepest longings, needs, and strengths. When I am weary of the crowds, help me to find places of silence and rest to renew my spirit. Spirit of life, be with me in my loneliness. Help me to be gentle with myself when I am feeling excluded, unloved, not enough. Sit with me in my grief when I am missing those who are gone. Comfort me with memories of connection and laughter. When I am in my deepest lonely despair, let it be a generative time of creation. Help me to channel my loneliness into artful expression. Allow my emptiness to steer me back to meaningful connections with those who love me. Spirit of life, in my solitude and in my loneliness, keep me company. Amen. Our reading this morning is by the 13th century Persian poet and Sufi mystic Rumi. The guest house. This being human is a guest house, every morning a new arrival. A joy, a depression, a meanness, some momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all. Even if they're a crowd of sorrows who violently sweep your house empty of its furniture, still treat each guest honorably. He may be clearing you out for some new delight. The dark thought, the shame, the malice, meet them at the door laughing and invite them in. Be grateful for whoever comes because each has been sent as a guide from beyond. Now is the time in our service. Thank you. I'd like to get something out of the way early in the service. It might as well come right at the beginning. Please raise your hand if you have ever in your life been lonely. Okay, I'm glad we have that settled. Now, for those of you who were maybe a little embarrassed and didn't want to look around because maybe you'd be the only one with your hand up, or for those of you who couldn't see how many hands were up because your neighbors only raised their hands like this, let me tell you that every person in this room had their hand up. So maybe not all of us are feeling lonely today on this Valentine's Day plus one week 2016, but I do want to assure you that every single one of us knows what it is like to feel lonely. Loneliness is a universal emotion caused by many different things, but one of the things that exacerbates it is the shame of feeling lonely. And I want to just dispense with that very quickly here because there is nothing, nothing to be ashamed of. You are not unique in your loneliness. It is not because you are socially awkward or unlikable or everything bad happens to you, nothing good ever happens to you. J 
Janice Joplin, shortly before her death, said that she was working on a tune called I Just Made Love to 25,000 People, But I'm Going Home Alone. Three of the most idolized women of the 20th century, Judy Garland, Marilyn Monroe, and Princess Diana, were famously lonely people. And we have all felt lonely. Some of us feel lonely right now, surrounded by people. And we will all feel lonely again at some point. So there. Okay, this sermon is for all of us. We are all right now in the same exploring loneliness boat for the next 20 minutes at least. And to get us into the mood to delve into loneliness, I've asked Mary and Brenda to share one of my favorite songs about loneliness. And poor Mary has a terrible cold, but she's a trooper, and she's going to sing it anyway. And we're, it'll only feel more lonely with the cold, right? And it's out, I have this old book that is just terribly torn and tattered. And uh, Randy Newman, who happens to be one of my favorite lyricists and writers, is the, uh, he's the one that penned this too. Before we move deeper into exploring loneliness, I want to differentiate loneliness from solitude. It is not the fact of being alone that determines if we are lonely. Theologian Paul Tillich once wrote, language has created the word loneliness to express the pain of being alone. And it has created the word solitude to express the glory of being alone. 
the poet and novelist May Sarton explains it like this, loneliness is the poverty of the self and solitude is the richness of the self. A sailor who frequently sailed alone on the open seas put it this way, solitude, he said, is when you are out on your boat and the wind fills the sails. Loneliness is when the wind dies. My colleague, Reverend Judith Walker Riggs, once wrote about loneliness this way. For every person stuck at home on Christmas Day, she said, with nothing but a box of Kleenex and a good book and an orange and a mug of cocoa, weeping in their isolation. There is another person stuck in a melange of mismatched family members, bombarded by Uncle Thorvald's political opinions, Aunt Mildred's religious rantings, and sister-in-law Sylvia's greasy corn dressing. Not to mention the group of high-pitched, excited children carelessly breaking whatever they can before bedtime. Who would give anything in the world to be alone with a good book and an orange and a mug of cocoa? I've also learned this, she says, that a lot of loneliness is the story you tell yourself about it. Not all, but a lot. Changing the story we tell ourselves is often the key to moving from losing ourselves in loneliness to being able to use it, even to enjoy it. So there's a big difference between being alone and being lonely. And we've talked about the pleasures of solitude in worship before. We've celebrated quiet, and we've explained introverts, and we've embraced the term quirky alone. But now it's time to think about the pain of loneliness. And as we do so, I want you to hang on to that question about the story we tell ourselves about our aloneness. Because I think that's the most challenging concept we will hear today. And it's one we need to sit with for a while. What is the story we are telling ourselves about our aloneness? But there's so much more to say about loneliness, so keep that one burning at the back of your mind as we continue. Psychologists tell us that there are three types of loneliness, and I'll touch on each one of them. The first is interpersonal loneliness. We experience this kind of loneliness when we have lost an important person in our life. It can be because they have died, moved away, broken up with us. It can also be the loneliness felt from not having a romantic partner or not having someone to be with on the holidays. This type of loneliness can feel like a weight, an emptiness, a darkness. It can fill our hearts and our days and especially, especially our nights. This type of loneliness can't be fixed by those around us, even our friends who love us. It's personal and intimate feeling of loneliness. You probably know it. Although we can't fix this loneliness for each other, we can be here to support one another through interpersonal loneliness. Although it doesn't heal the loneliness we are feeling, experiencing loving connections to each other can help us to get through. Feeling supported and loved helps to soften the edges of our loneliness. Many of us in this Meeting House community have lost people we cared about this year, and so I know you understand this sense of loneliness. And I want you to know that there is always a place for it here. Even on days like Valentine's Day, maybe especially on days like Valentine's Day. And so I am glad that you are here. The second type of loneliness is social loneliness. 
This is probably the most common type of this feeling, and even people who are in a relationship experience it. It's a feeling of lack of connection. You probably know it. Sometimes this comes from too much time alone and a need to get out and be around more people. Or it can be felt when you don't feel understood by a loved one. This type of loneliness can also be experienced as lack of social acceptance. We can feel this loneliness as isolation or rejection. The cool kids don't want to play with us. Social loneliness is tricky because while sometimes it is solved by getting together with friends or being with people, sometimes it can be exacerbated by being around others because it doesn't always go away with company. This type of loneliness actually has very little to do with how many friends we have. In general, those who feel lonely actually spend no more time alone than those who feel more connected. It's the way we feel inside. And some of it has to do with our expectations. What needs are we expecting others to fill in our lives? What do we do when we don't feel those social needs being met? What are our other resources? How do we reach out? Some of our feelings of loneliness date back to childhood feelings. We remember keenly being the last person picked for the team in gym class or that we never could seem to get enough love from an absent parent. And those old wounds follow us into adulthood. They resurface easily. So we have to be self-reflective when we are feeling lonely and gently ask ourselves, where is this coming from? If we are being completely honest with ourselves in that self-reflection, we might find that some of our loneliness is self-created. Remember that earlier question, what is the story I am telling myself about my aloneness? Each individual has a genetically set need for social inclusion, and our level of need will be different from everyone else's. If our need for connection is high, it might be difficult to meet those needs. Another factor of social loneliness is our ability to self-regulate the emotions associated with feelings of with feeling isolated. So not just outwardly, but deep inside. We all feel distress when our need for companionship is not fulfilled. How well we manage those feelings affects the degree of pain that we experience. If we are chronically upset by feelings of loneliness, this makes us less able to evaluate other people's intentions accurately. We may perceive them as rejecting when they aren't. We might feel slighted when that wasn't the intention. The results from a recent study at the University of Chicago show that the lonelier we are, the more attention is drawn toward negative social information. Lonely people seem hypervigilant to social threats and slights. It's unfortunate that such thinking itself most likely makes the loneliness worse by nudging the lonely to act more defensively, more hostile toward others, the ones they want to connect with. At the very time we feel the most need for connection, our manner and our physical signals might unintentionally communicate, stay away to others. Social loneliness is complex. I know that some of us feel lonely even here at the meeting house. And though we may be struggling with loneliness, reaching out to others is a huge step in working our way out of social loneliness. Isn't it amazing that we can reach out even in our pain and disappointment? We are so resilient. Being in community is a great tool for healing. And I am so glad you are here. The third type of loneliness is existential loneliness. It's what Zen teacher Ezra Beta describes as the anxious quiver of being. 
Isn't that a great description? The anxious quiver of being. Existential loneliness is an uneasiness, a desperate desire to change something about this moment. To me, it parallels the concept of dukkha, or suffering, in Buddhism. Tibetan Buddhist teacher Minger Rinpoche teaches that dukkha means the pervasive feeling that something isn't quite right, that life could be better if circumstances were different, that we'd be happier if... There's a Portuguese word, saudade, which can't exactly be translated into English, but it's a deep loneliness or longing a melancholy nostalgia for something that has perhaps not even happened. Ever since I heard that word, it was in a song. I love that word. I think it speaks to existential loneliness. You probably know it. From a spiritual perspective, existential loneliness is rich for exploration. It's the juiciest type of loneliness for mystics and theologians. Existential loneliness raises questions of life, death, purpose, and meaning. Are we really, in the end, just a human body that lives and dies for ourself alone? Or are we part of something larger? Can we use our loneliness and longing to connect with God? When we die, do we just end? Or do we join some continuing consciousness, the oversoul perhaps? Or do our energies mingle with the earth's energies, ashes to ashes, dust to dust? Is there a heaven where our loved ones are waiting for us, where we will never be lonely again? <gasps> Wrestling with existential loneliness calls us to connect with spirit, encourages us to find purpose, helps us to work at changing the world into that better one that we long for even if we haven't experienced it yet. I bet it's a sense of existential loneliness that drove many of you to find this community, to join with other seekers, asking questions of purpose, and seeking to be part of something larger than yourself. I'm glad you followed that inner calling, and I am so glad that you are here. Together, we can explore these existential questions. We can use our loneliness to connect us to each other, to spirit, to the world we hope to create. I titled this morning's service, The Lonely Hearts Club. Thank you to the Beatles for letting me borrow it. Maybe you don't like to think of yourself as a member of the Lonely Hearts Club, but I kind of like it. We may not seek out loneliness. We may avoid it at all costs. But there is a deep purpose to loneliness. The social pain of loneliness serves to protect us from the dangers of isolation. Loneliness helps us to change behaviors, to pay more attention to relationships, and to create and nurture connections. Loneliness asks us to seek our place in the world more intentionally and meaningfully. And our own loneliness inspires empathy for the loneliness of others, which helps us to reach out, to care for each other, to form community. Our longing and loneliness for the sublime world and relationships that we have yet to experience call us forward to what can be. So let us be proud members of the Lonely Hearts Club, but only in so much as our membership serves our growth and not our despair. Remember what Rumi tells us. This being human is a guest house. Every morning a new arrival, a joy, a depression, a meanness, some momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor. 
welcome and entertain them all. Even if they're a crowd of sorrows who violently sweep your house empty of its furniture, still treat each guest honorably. She may be clearing you out for some new delight. The dark thought, the shame, the malice, meet them at the door laughing and invite them in. Be grateful for whoever comes because each has been sent as a guide from beyond. As we welcome the guest of loneliness into our hearts, may we be here for one another. May we reach out to one another, be tender with one another, love one another. May we remember that even in the depths of our despair, even in our dukkha, our longing, our grief, even in our petty neediness, even in our saudade, even in our deepest desire for a world we've never lived in, even in our personal heartache, we are not alone. We have each other. Human kindness is overflowing, and I think it's going to rain today. Happy Valentine's Day. Amen and blessed be. And I'll invite you to join us in our closing hymn and then our closing words. And if you could stay with us and stay seated later for the postlude, we have a couple of treats for you. But for now, please join me in our closing hymn, number 354, We Laugh, We Cry.